So hi everyone. Uh, for all the res residents here in the Apollo group, uh, I'm going to talk about lumbar canal stenosis, and uh, we're going to cover up a few points here. One is the pathophysiology, the clinical radiological presentations, and the principles. So what's stenosis? The word actually comes from a Greek word, which is stenos, which actually means narrow. And as it keeps converted into a noun and eventually an adjective, it's actually narrowing, as we call it. And the abnormal narrowing of any passage in the body is stenosis. So that's one of the words we are talking about. Now, when it comes to the spine, which is the spinal stenosis, it's a narrowing of the neural foramina, the lateral recess, and with, this, with or without the central spinal canal. When this happens, the nerve structures start to get impinged, which can cause inflammation, irritation, and leading to pain, which is one of the commonest presentation or occasionally neurological deficit. Now, when the low back pain is affected, we call it the lumbar spinal stenosis or lumbar canal stenosis. Now, why do we need to know all this? Because with increasing life expectancy, we are going to see more and more geriatric population and therefore more the incidence. So as eventually when all of you all actually go into practice, you're going to end up seeing more geriatric patients living longer and therefore the incidence is bound to happen. It contributes to the largest group along with the PIDs, which is the prolapsed intervertebral disc of spinal pathologies in an orthopedic practice. It's a more disability or quality of life oriented spinal pathology. So nobody is going to die because of spinal canal stenosis. It is going to be more morbidity and disability oriented. And therefore you have to take the patient's demands, his expectations, his needs, his issues into consideration before you offer a treatment. And very important, a red herring is going to be the differential diagnosis and the comorbidities essentially. So we all know the basic anatomy of the spine, but we'll run through it quickly. Let's look at concentrate the axial section here, which is this section here. We know that that's the vertebral body there, the spinous processes, the part of the facet there, and the transverse process. This is how you see it in an actual view. All of us will agree that. Now, this area, which is the red mark, is what we call as the central canal. The one next to it is called the lateral recess, which is anterior to the superior articular facet. Uh, and also remember, this is called as the entrance. The foraminal area is actually in between the pedicles. So if you look at, at this area, in between these two pedicular areas is where the foraminal area is, which is called the mid zone. And obviously the extra foraminal area is beyond the pedicles, which is this area. Now, why is this important? We're going to discuss this as we go on from here, but this has to be a basic concept kept in mind. Now, what are the culprits? What leads to all this? What are the things that lead to all this? It's actually the overgrowth of bones. If you actually look at this, this is how a osteophyte, as we call it, or overgrowth of bone happens because of the wear and tear, either due to the arthritis of the facet or because of disease degeneration. And that's one of the major contributors, overgrowing bone. The herniated discs, as you can see here. So if you look at the herniated disc, a disc itself can contribute to an increasing compromise in the canal space. Thickened ligaments either behind, which is the ligamentum flavum, or in the front, which is actually the PLL can contribute because they are getting stiffer as you get older. Instability, as you can see here, where one vertebrae slips over the other, which can also contribute to the lumbar canal stenosis. And obviously, not last but not the least, the facetal arthropathy because of the laxity, which can encroach. So all these are culprits, actually, if you see. Now let's look at each of them. The posterior longitudinal ligament. All of us know which this one is the posterior longitudinal ligament here, which you can see. And this is an important component, much less than ligamentum flavor, but does contribute into the, uh, the lumbar cholesterol de uh, developing. It's actually used for proprioceptive function and it's actually the suspensory ligament for the dural side. So mind you, it has to be kept in mind. It thickens as we get arthritic or osteophytic and therefore it causes compression. The second one is actually the ligamentum flip. As you can see here, it underwrites the superior lamina and attaches to the inferior lamina. So if you look at it, it underwrites the superior lamina. It's very important 
we'll know that when we do operate on them, why is it important? Because this is one of the areas where you can wrench the ligamentum flavor and the dura is in close apposition. A lot of additions in this segment. So it underwrites the superior lamina and it attaches to the inferior lamina. This is also an important component. And mind you, when you actually operate in a surgical fit, this is the biggest component which we are kind of removing or releasing the dura from. So ligamentum flavor. Third is the facets. We all know just like a synovial joint, it's got a capsule. And as it turns arthritic, the arthropathy induced osteophytes and the wear and tear not only contribute to back pain, but also important that it contributes to neural compression there in the outlets. Moreover, facet joints we know is a mobile joint. So it's important that as we move and use the spine at multi-segmental level, the more arthropathy sets in and the more stenotic it is, we also know that flexion and extension have different effects in the stenosis, which we'll discuss as we go on from here. The morphometry is important. Now, some of us are actually born with a nice round um, canal. Some of them has, has triangular canals. Some of us have what we call the, the trifoiled canals, which is actually like three lobe arches, one arch here, one arch there, one here. As we move from a round to a triangular to the trifoiled, the morphometry makes you more and more prone to having what we call as lumbar canal stenosis. When the trifoil nature actually becomes asymmetric, for example, as you see here, here the asymmetry is well defined, which is causing more compression on that side as compared to this side. So it's important that when you have trifoiled and asymmetric canals, that's where the maximum chance of developing lumbar canal stenosis is. Now, muscle forces, very common if you see that somebody, if you have, you've seen a patient with polio, you know one side at paramyspinal muscles are weak, the other side is stronger, and therefore the entire morphometry, including the spinous processes over a period of time, turns scoliotic and get pulled onto one side. So imagine a scenario that you have a trifoil canal, asymmetric, with muscle forces acting asymmetrically on either side. Obviously, there is going to be tropism of the facet joints. There are going to be pedicular changes that develop. And obviously, this influences the shape of the canal, as you can see here in the diagrammatic pose. So muscle forces are also equally important, especially in degenerative and de novo scoliosis, which is common with lumbar canal stenosis. We know spines not a fixed area. It's a multi-dimensional mobile segment. So torsion, flexion, compressive forces, all of them combine and each of them, including the apophysial joints, the ligaments contribute in some way to cause resistance in each of these movements. Now, as the ligamentous destruction tends to build up with time, as the disc degeneration builds up, as the facetal arthropathy builds up, there is found to be a multi-pronged effect in the biomechanics, which itself can contribute to the synthesis. So that's how a pathophysiological segment, if you take a cut section and look at it, you can see how well the good facets are defined, where here they turn arthropathic. We know this is the foraminal outlet for the right nerve, the left nerve, which gets compromised in case of a stenotic. The ligamentum hypertrophy per se converts a nice round or at least a triangularish canal into a complete block in the foramen exit and the discs as they degenerate also contribute to it. The discs contribute in a way that as they get degenerated, they collapse and as they collapse, the foraminal space is encroached upon. So pathophysiologically, this is how they present. Now let's look at clinical physiologically. We know classically what we call as the shopping cart syndrome. Now, what does that mean? An old man in the lumbar stenotic area age group is found to be very comfortable when he holds on to the shopping cart because of the inherent flexion that you create here. Now, why is that? We know in extension, the spinal canal shortens. So if you somebody extends, the spinal canal shortens, it broadens the nervous tissue, it increases, shortens, and broadens the compressive element of the ligamentum flavor, the disc protrusion further compromises because as you go into extension, the posterior part of the disc tends to extrude and facets encroach more. 
That's why you find most of them clinophysiologically very uncomfortable in extension. One, the extension pain is because of the facets hurting, but at the same time, it also tends to cause impingement of the nerve more, nerve more because of reduced space. In flexion, for that matter, it actually gets better. And that's why this classical shopping cart syndrome, which we find. Now, what are the theories of stenosis? There are two components. One is the vascular and the other is mechanical. What's the vascular component to it? What essentially happens is that the good vasculature and the nutritional supply to the nerve root as it leaves the spine is com compromised because of edema, because of inflammation, because of ischemia, because of altered metabolic processes, and finally, obviously, what we call as fibrosis. When the dynamic component, which is the mechanical component, as you can see here, you know how the plastic tube, there is a water flow and you impinge it at two points. We know that the water flow is getting compromised below. So this is a mechanical component where there is a collapse of the disc height. The articular surfaces tend to become cauliflowerish or the arthropathic joints become cauliflowerish, which is intruding into the canal, especially the lateral races in the foramen. There is a neural foramen narrowing and there is an impingement of the exiting root or the traversing root. Also remember that these are all happening actually when you are static, which you are actually lying down. But say you stand up and start walking, the epidural pressures increase 20 millimeter mercury with each step. So the moment you're upright, the whole dynamics gets more aggravated because of the rotatory movements and the multi-prong movements that happen in the spine. And that's why most of them tend to get affected when they are walking. When they are sitting and lying down, they're much better. They're not always good, but much better. But the moment they are upright and walking, it tends to aggravate. So this is the mechanical component. Now, there's a small third component, which is what called as a corollary component to it. There is an external pressure on the nerve, but there is also what we call as an intraneural compartment syndrome. As orthopedic residents, you know what the compartment syndrome is. So when there is external pressure, the internal pressure within the nerve also contributes to the problem. So long-standing leads, constant long-standing edema, which sets in here, also leads to what we call as a fibrotic scar. And that is what contributes to a combined pathophysiological effect in lumbar canal stenosis. What tends to happen is increasing compression, adding up to further edema and further inflammation, added up by mechanical compression, and eventually ending up in cortical evoked potential getting low, histological changes, which is very well depicted here, as you can see, that because of chronicity, this is a nice nerve root cross-section scene, but as it tends to become more and more chronic, you can see that the fibrotic system, a fibrotic elements start to come into play, and this one is very severely fibrotic. So how well it's depicted in the pathophysiological specimen there. So this is a standard textbook picture, which I think is a combination of what, what we discussed. There is a posterior joint involvement. There is an intervertebral disc involvement. Posterior joint undergoes a cascading system of synovial reaction, cartilage destruction, osteophytic formation. There is a laxity in the capsules. There is a little subluxation which sets in and all that adds to an articular process enlargement. The discs contribute in a way to circumferential tears, internal disruptions, loss of disc height, disc resorbs. So there is a fall in the height and therefore osteophytes lead to stenosis. When this tends to happen at multiple levels, you have multiple level spinal canal stenosis. Now, this is again textbook. We are not going to dwell in it because all of you are going to go ahead and read it in the books. But classification generally has got two components. One is congenital, which is what we also call as developmental, and the other is the acquired. The congenital ones are actually the idiopathic or the classical achondroplasics, what we call as the dwarf structured people wherein inherently they are born with small canals. Mind you, what we were discussing pathophysiologically earlier was actually the progressive age-related degenerative wear. Whereas in an achondroplastic actually happens right through the spinal canal, including bony elements. 
So there is a difference in approach because in the degenerative group, it's the soft tissues which are contributing more. Whereas in a developmental chondroplastic, it's actually the bony as well as soft tissue and the bony components more. It's important because that's how we're going to approach when you eventually treat it. What's going to be more important in today's topic, it's the acquired group, which is a combination of degenerative or a spondylolytic or lysthetic, which we will discuss partly here. Iatrogenic, which is post-surgical, post-traumatic, and probably other groups like Pagets and fluorosis, which is more academic in nature, but not going to be discussed so much in this uh, talk. So how does this patient come to you? <clears throat> we've looked at pathophysiology. We've actually looked at pathology. We've looked at the clinical physiological reasons. But how does this patient generally come to you? One, they can come with pain in the lower back. And classically, what they tell you is that I used to have a lot of back pain very early in life. The back pain actually has got better. Probably one, because their thresholds for the pain has got adjusted or that the back pain component itself has gone down. So they have this dull tenderness ache, sometimes like an electrical or burning sensation in and around the back. It comes and goes. That's how they come. Then they have the classical sciatica, which is something which all patients tell you now, not knowing what they're talking about. But that's the pain that comes from the buttock, extends down into the leg, and commonest root available, uh, involved is the L5, which we know because anatomical preponderance to that area. There's this classical heaviness feeling, or they say that pair bhari lakta, which is they feel that they've got some 20 kilos tied onto their legs, and as they walk, they feel that they have pulled that 20 kilos along as they walk which else leads to a little cramping. There is numbness, which is pins and needles and that kind of feeling and weakness in the leg or the foot as the stenotic worsens. The presentation also is very interesting. They'll tell you that as they walk uphill and uphill walking, if any of you all try walking, you always tend to stoop a little forward, trying to hold on to the center of gravity and balancing it. They say that it's much easier, but then they have, the time they have to walk downhill they are actually struggling. Uh, the third is early bladder. Now, this is a very tentative question and a difficult question to discuss. They talk about the fact that their frequency of urine is affected, but then they believe that this is because they've got prostatic symptoms. But along with frequency, they believe that they find it difficult to hold on to urine. As in, they tell you that initially they could wait around, around an hour without a problem, but nowadays they have to go quickly and void quickly, they find it difficult to watch. It's more difficulty in control and not so much the frequency because in men especially, frequency could be prostatic in nature. So these are the general broadline symptoms. What's the beauty about Lumber Canal stenosis is that if you have it as an exam um, case, there are a lot of symptoms, but there are no elicitable signs. And that's very, very important because the gait generally, as we said, is a little forward flexed, a little low pelvis rotation gait. The posture normally, like I said, forward flex or with a little coronal imbalance because of scoliotic bags. There are no tenderness spots. You might thump the bag, you might do pressure tenderness, point tenderness, but you will realize that it's not so much at all. You will realize he has fantastic range of motion, except the ones who have had an acute increase in back pain or very severe facial arthropathy, which can give you painful extension. So when you ask them to go back, which is in painful extension, they can have pain. And the neurological examination in most times look normal. They have full SLRs. At L4-5, though it is common, weakness is a rarity. Even if it does, they have a sudden acute increase in symptom before the weakness. You will realize that even the signs, the tension signs are not so much, except in the group where there is some acute disc, which is over and above exaggerated or underlying stenosis. So in stenotics, you will realize that there are more symptoms than signs. It's very unlike what we see in a disc, where there are a lot of signs that you can elicit. So if it comes as a full, I mean, uh, a full case in, in your exams, remember that there are not going to be too many signs uh, in lumbar canal stenosis. Now, what's important here is that you need to know the differential diagnosis. And this is the key. I mean, if there is any take home message, which we start from here, the moment you start seeing a lot of lumbar canal stenosis, the more you see MRIs in X-rays in patients, the bias leads you to either miss 
associated problems or kind of totally not see those relevant signs which are important. So you have to not miss this differential diagnosis group. One, obviously, they are going to be osteoarthritic in knees and hips because they are that age group. Two, you should not miss out on sacroiliac joint pathologies. Three, cervical myelopathies, which are associated. You should also not miss out on contiguous tandem compressions in the cervical, thoracic, and thoracolumbar areas. Parkinsonism, peripheral neuropathy, and for you as orthopedic residents, vascular insufficiency, which is there on the top. It is unpardonable to miss this and label a patient as lumbar canal stenotic and even plan a definitive treatment unless you've gone through these. So let's look at each of them. One of the commonest things you see is OA knees. The knee joint is arthritic, knee joint is painful, and they've been living with this knee for so long. But suddenly they talk about the last two months where they realize their entire leg tends to become painful. They can't even stand for 15, 20 minutes. Unlike earlier with the bad knees, they used to be mobile. And please remember, it's a vice versa thing. Uh, in between us as orthopedic surgeons, the joint surgeons generally have a little more bias to the joints. The spine surgeons have a bias to the spine. But I think we have to keep the biases away. Lumbar canal stenosis and osteoarthritic knees happen contiguously. And therefore, when you offer treatment, please make it a point to elicit a great history, look for signs and ask the patient a point question. What troubles you more? Is it the knee or the spine or the entire leg for that matter? Because it's very difficult for them to differentiate claudication from OA knee pain. So very good insight into the clinical picture is important. So you can't afford to miss this. Uh, this is very classical. For example, this is a patient who actually came with a knee pain, but when we probed a little more, there was actually an aggravation of the pain. The knee was the area of the pain. We all believed it was something, but it actually was a facetal cyst. So a simple synovial cyst in the spine, but the bias turned towards the highly varroid knees and we thought that we had to do something for it, but um, a little more insight into the clinical picture, facetal cyst, and this patient could avoid, not that eventually he had to have totally replacement done, but could avoid a knee surgery. So it's very important now for us. The second is facet syndrome. Now these guys are all arthropathic in nature. And if you look at the pattern of pain, they'll say that whenever they extend their bags, they have this pain which comes from the bag, goes on to the buttock area and kind of feels sore. Now, please remember this pain is different from the classical dermatomal radiculopathy where the whole pain goes down into the leg. This is very buttock oriented and actually their SLRs could be positive because the muscles gone into spasm rather than anything else. Facet syndrome and this can be easily handled purely by just giving some medication if not a facetal block and that syndrome can get looked after. This is another thing which can be a red herring. So we have this inherent bias of a stenotic back, but he comes with pure back pain. Uh, be very careful to look into beyond the ordinary, you know, look beyond the ordinary. Sacroiliitis, another big red herring. Either, as you can see here, bilateral sacroiliitis with obviously a seronegative arthropathy, an angst spawned or whatever we're looking at, or a unilateral one, like how you can have in an infection like TB. So sacroiliac joint signs have to be looked into too because they could mimic in a certain way some of the sacroiliac joint pains, though we say it's just about two, two and a half inches from the center of the back, but also can kind of go around the thigh, around the buttocks and kind of mimic a part of the lumbar canal stenosis picture. But we should be very sure that we are not missing on that. If any doubt, go beyond the ordinary and especially not only clinical, but imaging because you might end up looking being an absolute fool in often surgery for a lumbar canal stenotic with an underlying sacroiliac. So very important. This is extremely important. You have to remember that the cervical spine and the lumbar spine actually are both the mobile segments. The thoracic we know has no mobility because the rib cage prevents the mobility. So the cervical and the lumbar are the lordotic mobile segments. And it's but natural that if something can happen in the lower compartment, it's bound to happen in the upper compartment. So pathophysiologically, we completely appreciate that cervical canal stenosis can coexist 
with lumbar canal stenosis. But where I'm bringing this topic is that there are some people who come with symptoms, but you have to look beyond it. For example, a hyperreflexic knee should make you think that we are not looking here at lumbar canal stenosis, something wrong. We have to look up. Ask the patient about their hand signs. Ask the patient about how they feel when they are mobile. Ask them to button or unbutton or find signs which are related to cervical canal stenosis. And therefore, you can't afford to miss it because the simple logic is that you have a tank at the top of the building. You've got a blood flow, I mean, water flow coming down. If I stop the knob at the 10th floor or the second floor, the ground floor is going to feel the same effect, no water. So if I open the second floor knob, but I'm going to keep the 10th floor knob shut, how is water going to flow? So it's a contiguous effect of both levels and look for signs of cervical myelopathy. Mind you, cervical myelopathy or stenosis have a lot of signs which you can't miss. So you have to look beyond the lumbar canal. And therefore, there are people who come with, the suggestion is come with a lot of MRIs for the lumbar spine, but always choose a screening because you will never miss a cervical canal stenosis, especially in people whom you suspect to have a problem. Parkinsonism, another complete... Uh, something that can fool you completely, you have what we call as a monoplegic Parkinsonism presentation. Just one hand can show early signs of Parkinsonism and therefore you should, or one leg can, and you should not miss it. Look for the signs behind. Use your colleagues, especially the neurologists in those cases where you feel that there is a problem. The leonine facies and the other factors that is described in books might come earlier, but you have to look uh, for signs which are suggestive of a CNS problem. The other way around, a myelopathic cervical can present with only tremors, which makes you think it's Parkinson's. So it's a it's a com it's a dual effect. I mean, it can go it's a double whammy because it can go both sides, and therefore it's important not to miss it. And the key, but not last but not the least, you should differentiate neurogenic claudication from vascular claudication, which means you look for the pulsations. It's taught to us always that the moment you finish examination, look at the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. These are both important pulsation not to miss. Neurogenic claudication and vascular claudication have to be differentiated by looking at pulses, looking at the skin changes, and most important in the history, does the position of the lumbar spine alter the scenario, which means if a patient says that when I am flexing or stooping, I get better, then it's neurogenic. In other cases, unaffected by the lumbar posture. Another important thing is that the walking distance, which is the ability to walk, is variable. The neurogenic claudication group says that there are good days I walk about 15 20 minutes, other days I'm struggling for 5 10 minutes, but a vascular claudication group have got fixed distances before the onset of the symptom. And from there on, it increases. So the symptomatology, whether the lumbar postural changes alter the presentation, how's the skin and pulsation, these four points stay in your mind deep rooted because you can't afford to miss a vascular claudication in an underlying neurogenic body. You have to learn to differentiate. The last in this group of differential diagnosis, peripheral neuropathy and diabetic amyotrophy. And this is one of my red herrings, which I learned in my experience. I had one patient who had admitted for lumbar canal stenosis. Uh, the resident called me up and said that severe pain. I asked him where, right above knee, thigh pain. Does it go down below the knee? Yes, it does go below the knee. And I, had, I was a little late. I kind of came and saw the patient later in the day. Severe stenosis. I mean, there's no question about it, but somewhere the symptom didn't match. The symptoms were pretty above knee. It was in the thigh area. It was just unrelated to activity, even rest pain. And therefore, we got a neurologist involved. We ran tests, and that was a very classical case of diabetic amyotrophy. It just needed some steroids and immunoglobulins to get it better. Not the surgery would have not done the job for the stenosis, but the patient would have stayed unhappy my, after my post, my, despite doing the best job for him. So don't miss a diabetic amyotrophy or peripheral neuropathy at this stage. Uh, okay. So any questions till the, uh, Agni, uh, Agnivesh? Yes, sir. There? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm here, very much here. Ah, so at this stage, any questions or I can go ahead? Because we finished clinical physiology, we finished pathophysiology, we finished differential and we finished symptoms. Uh, do you want me to take questions or we'll have it all at the end? We can have any questions from the audience, from the participants. Or we can move towards the end, sir. We can, yeah, we yeah, can have in the end, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Then I'll go ahead, basically. Okay. So... Now, once you know what your diagnosis is, you will actually find in our clinics, patients come in with a lot of MRIs. There'll be 17 MRIs done at multiple centers over a period of two years. If you ask them in an X-ray, they wouldn't have an X-ray. And why is it important? And all of us, including Dr. Yadav, Dr. Agnivesh Tiku, will agree on the fact that an X-ray reveals, reveals far more than an MR could do. Now, look at this one. And all you boys there who are actually seeing Look at this. If you start counting from L5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and there you kind of see one rib here. And then you're saying, oh, is this L1 or D12? Then you start counting. Is it D12, L1, 2, 3, 4? So where's the 5? So this is extremely important. Why is it important? Because the only mistake that, sorry, mistake that causes wrong endpoints to any intervention is level, level, and level. So an X-ray is mandatory. Is that only for the level? No. You look at the vacuum sign in a disc degeneration. You look at the chronicity and the wear and tear. You look at the lysthetic segments, whether it's degenerative or lytic, which is here. And all these points are important because at the end of the day, these are going to be your marker indices for a successful endpoint to your treatment. What about osteoporosis? Equally important. So an X-ray gives you basic insight. It's like looking at the wall and you know how bad the wall is. Is it, you know, you've got cement peeling off somewhere or not. The internal wiring issues are going to be dealt with it after that. So the wall needs to be looked at first and that's where the X-rays are important. Then the big issue of a flexion extension. If you look at all of us, you will realize that when a patient gets admitted, we are all telling you do flexion extension use, flexion extension use. Now, I learned my lesson, and I mean, this is very early in my practice, but I learned my lesson in this case. If you look at this one, this is a X-ray radiological picture of an AP and lateral view, which is taken lying down in about 62-year-old. She was our staff nurse's mother. Uh, I have not put all the MRIs here, but I have put the actual sections here, and you will notice, obviously, without a doubt, there is some amount of fluid, what we call as facetal effusion here on one side. I said, okay, the other side doesn't look too bad. It's arthropathic here, but facial effusion one side. But like a pattern and like a protocol, we asked for a flexion extension use. And voila, look at that flexion extension use as to the amount of opening out here, the amount of increase in the aesthetic segment, the amount of the angulation, aggravation. To an extent, you actually think whether she got some lysis somewhere, whether a break in the past. Actually, she didn't. But how different a flexion extension view looks from a simple basic view. So golden rule is that you should have flexion extension views just like you do HIV, HBS, AGs, and HCVs. For an admission into the hospital, you have to have flexion extension views. And it's a must because it kind of gives and opens the Pandora's box most times. So what does literature say? There is enough and more angles and uh, you know numbers given, but as a baseline, an angle change more than 10 degrees and a lysthetic translation more than 3 mm are supposed to be the generalized cutoffs. There are enough a number of papers in literature, but this is what we all want to put a consensus on. This is important because it defines your treatment protocol. Also, like I brought in in that sister's mother's case, facetal effusion is also another sign of instability, as we call it. So, when you look at it, you realize there's so much talk about instability. What are the instability markers? So one is flexion extension X-rays, facetal effusion, which you can see. The amount of arthropathic changes, the more arthritic the joints, the more possibility that you can have an instability. So it's very, very important to keep in mind. In the West, we are very lucky. They have what we call as an upright MRI, where we simulate how the MRI would look when you load the body. For example, if I stand, how does the biomechanics look different from how is it when we lie down? 
and therefore the upright MRI actually shows. See, look at this one. This is when you're lying down, you look, it's not so, it's innocuous. You feel it's not too bad. But the moment you load, the whole, what we call is biomechanics changes, the whole concept changes. We are still not very lucky to have this, but this is probably the future to see. So treat these two differently. Because here you have to remember that the amount of facility the amount of decompression, the amount of facets that you're going to wear and take, I mean, erode off is very high and therefore treat these two differently. What about other markers, facetal fluid I talked about, synovial cysts we talked about. We looked at the interspinous fluid. Now this is the spinous process there, spinous process here, and high intense fluid here makes you probably look at the risk of instability. Facetal joint arthropathy, the vacuum phenomena, all these show features of that. Where does CT have a role? It does have a great role in the orientation of the facets because we know certain sagittally oriented facets have higher risk of uh, what we call as instability. The arthropathies are well defined and therefore with the disc and the joint, you can combine to show the effects in lumbar canal stenosis. This is very academic, but it is just to show how the MRI is graded depending upon free increasing stenosis. You see how the rootlets Initially, they're clumped up down, and as they keep getting more and more stenotic, they start getting clumped closer and closer as the severity increases. This is not important, but it's more academic. Now, when is there an aggravation of a stenosis? When it is superided by a disc. So just like a disc pathology aggravates a stenosis, you should know what you're looking for. Why? You should look at the migration of a disc. Let's presume you operated this guy, but totally forgot to look at the superior or inferior migrations of the disc you're probably doing an incomplete job. So it makes you look beyond just the stenosis, look at where the disc is migrated. Second, in a redo scenario, which means you have a patient who's already operated upon and he comes to you with a lot of leg pain. One of the first things you look for is either a segment above, below, recurrence, but it could be plain and simple arachnoiditis. If you burn your fingers in trying to do good by reoperating, you're actually going to make him worse. So in this scenario, it's the arachnoid, the clumping of the roots that you can see there. It's a red herring and be very careful to differentiate a disc with arachnoiditis or a scar. I said, why the sequence in the MRI? For example, a lumbar canal stenosis, yeah, you plan everything, but suddenly you see when you do a sequence, there's severe dorsal lumbar junctional compression. So you can't afford to, just like cervical canal stenosis, look beyond the ordinary. This is a clinical radiological correlation. So you can't afford not to miss it. Also in the MR, you're looking at whether the disc is the more of a component or the facet is more of a component. So this also gives you an insight on how to treat. Look for far lateral discs, as we see here, which could be one of the aggravating features or a free fragment, which could be one of the aggravating features. Obviously, I said fascicle cysts, and most importantly, differentiate between a lytic and a degenerative. Why? Because in a root to be decompressed is a exiting root in lysis. That means in an L5S1 lytic lysis, you look at the L5 root, whereas the L5S1 degenerative lysis, you will look at the S1 root, which is the traversing root. I hope you are there with me, all of you. It's very important. Calcified discs are important because you know that when you eventually are going to be operating this person, you're going to need osteotomies to take the calcific hard disc. So it's like a mental preparation of what's coming. Obviously, you have can't miss other things like granulation. This was a cox in case of a so-called stenotic, which you can't miss. Or an SOL here, if you can see here, was mimicking. But when I look, it looked completely barren normal. So you have to look beyond the ordinary. So red herrings in radiology, you can't afford to miss it. The most difficult to interpret at any stage of your career is the MRI in scoliote, because if you look at this mid sag it looks so confusing. So the axials have a lot of role, looking at the foramens, the lateral recesses here, and even a nice myelogram picture in an MRI can reflect on what we need to do, which route or which level is to be given priority. So look beyond the ordinary again here. Two important investigations, which we'll wind up before the investigations is EMG nerve conduction. One, especially in a diabetic, it not only prognosticates your treatment protocol, it also defines how much benefit the patient could get, how much the problem is contributed by a longstanding diabetic neuropathy, and how much it is contributing by a compressive radiculopathy. So that differentiation is well-defined. 
So an EMG NCV, especially as in when required. And the Doppler studies because of the vascular prodigation, because you can't afford to miss any of them. Once your diagnostics one are over, once your clinical radiological correlation is over, then the problem starts. What to do for these guys? These people, mind you, are old, osteoporotic, degenerated, probably he's got other comorbidities like diabetes, blood pressure, thyroid, cardiac surgery is done. So what to give them? Now, a historic paper, which is kept mentioned by the people who look at conserving, says, this is the Scandinavian paper, which came out in 1999-2000, which says that 41% improved without doing anything much at all. And observation was supposed to be a good alternative than an operative treatment. 10 years later, they look back, his fellow Amundsen looked back at the same set at a 10-year follow-up and they found that 55% of them remain unchanged. Mind you, but this 55% is a very complex group. What generally happens is that they have lifestyle adjustment, which means somebody in 1990 and 2000 said, I wanted to walk 25 minutes. Now I can walk 10 minutes, but I'm mighty happy talking 10 minutes. So it's lifestyle adjustment. 30% obviously worsen and 15% improve with time. Now, these are the ones who probably had a disc overriding a stenosis when they were evaluated. The disc component regressed or got better. The nerve adjusted and therefore they improved with time. So this picture that's put across should be taken with a pinch of salt because there are many other things involved. But this was a very good comprehensive study which was looked at and standing up for the conservative management. So what essentially they tried to look at was 91% of their 145 patients had sacrificed results. But what wasn't mentioned is what was the duration of follow-up and what happened during long-term follow-ups. So the people who talk about non-surgical management in stenotis have their limitations and therefore we need to take it with a proper analytical mind, not on the face value. But what do you want to do? All this can be done. We'll run through them quickly in the conservative management. We know NACIDs most times are not good. We know NACIDs cause a lot of harm because they already are in a lot of compromised comorbidities. So look at the individual metabolism and comorbidities associated. Long-term use of any medication is not good. Paracetamol and acetaminophens probably have the safest profile. We all know this. We also know that we have to improve vitamin D, calcium, B12, treat the osteoporosis, give them neuromodulators like gabapentin and pregabalin, add up amitriptylines or probably the fluoxetine and duloxetine groups, but all of them have to be carefully handled. One of the major issues with duloxetine is actually urinary retention and therefore they tend to have, especially ones with prostatic issues. So they come with subtle symptoms which get aggravated with prolonged use. Try using localized medication than oral installation. So drug delivery systems can be well used and obviously use physical therapy as and when required with the help of the physiotherapist. The aim obviously is to not let them run a marathon. The aim is to let them return to activities of daily living. So the main important point is that outline and tailor their expectation. Talk to them and ask you, what is your requirement? Today, what do you want to do? If he says, yeah, X amount of thing, then try to make their rehab regimen to satisfy what their requirements are at and not ours in the physiotherapist because they can go overboard. Pain control by use of judicious use of medications because it will help them participate in exercises. Does bed rest have a role? Unlike discs, the longer you keep these people in bed, the more problems they'll have, urinary infection, respiratory infection, etc. So obviously, early return back to a supervised rehab by taking care not only of their medical status, which means you're not going to ask somebody who's had a post bypass to do stuff which will strain his heart, but at the same time, you encourage a home program because these are people who are not going to be going to the physios every day. They could be retired, monetary issues, so many other things to look for. So encourage a home program. There are multiple modalities which can be freely used because we know they don't cause harm, even if they don't cause good. And a point on immobilization. One of the things we randomly give is a corset. Don't overuse it because the muscles shouldn't turn weak. Couple it with exercises to improve their functional activity. The physios can go through with these trigger points, which will help in sometimes. And most of them have some underlying cognitive behavior therapy issues because they find they suddenly start to feel they are worthless. They can contribute nothing. And a big part of their problem is actually behavioral changes. So that has to also be looked in the West. This is a very, very important form 
of treatment modalities. What about interventions? The two important ones which you're going to talk about is the facets and the epidural steroids. And you've seen all of us give this in different forms at different times. We know that most of the problem in this case, one of the big contributors is fascicle joint arthropathy. So obviously, what we need to do is block that. I mean, just like we used to consider earlier intra-articular knee injections and shoulders, etc. The facet joints actually contribute a big part, especially in the facet syndrome group. So this pain can be got down, especially if there is no neurology, and especially if the pattern of pain marks very similar to the facet syndrome. We know the group of nerves or the nervelets that we are going to block. Whatever done, said and done, it helps in improving the patient to contribute in an exercise program. What about the epidural steroids? Obviously, whole new different ballgame. It's more for low back plus radicular symptom. So there is some amount of neural irritability. Will you go ahead and do it for everybody with lumbar canal stenosis? No, not in the severe group, not in the ones with early deficits, but in the ones who have mild to moderate, who can have a certain amount of relief and who at some point of time is not mentally prepared for an intervention. So either the transforaminal epidural blocks that can be given, the root blocks or the caudal, choose or involve a pain management specialist who is trained to help you with the epidural steroids and the patients get their benefit. So in a non-surgical modality of treatment has all these put together and each of them should be used as a combined multi-prong effect rather than just individual and independent. So when do we operate? We are surgeons. We are orthopedic surgeons for that matter. We love to operate. So where do we operate? Once when we know that you failed conservative measures. Now failed conservative measure is a very broad statement, relative. I could feel that the conservative measure is failed in three weeks. Somebody else could feel it in eight months. Somebody else could feel it in two years. I think the best person to make the final call in this case is the patient because they know when they feel that the standard conservative measures have failed. Emergency procedure is only in a cauda equina syndrome and they normally happen when you have a superadded acute disc over a stenosis as we said. Now what to do? If you look at the OT list of all of us, you will see there are sometimes we are only decompressing. The other times we are fusing. Sometimes we are doing supplementary instrumentation or doing just non-instrumented fusion. So how do you all decide what to do when? Before we get into that, you should know your basic steps. So first thing, confirm your levels. Two, you know your pars and facet joints are the most important stabilizers, so don't destabilize them. You have two forms of decompression, the central canal, as we started off the top, and the lateral. You should be sure you've done adequate decompression and good closure. These are your basic tenants, if you call it. In the central decompression, which we'll look at slides later, we are looking at use of good spinous cutting rongeurs, which is kerosene punches, as we have seen. When you all go out in practice, uh, not to put the industry in it, but there'll be a lot of push by the companies to sell particular screws and instruments and implants. But if you realize, they'll never be very excited to sell a forward punch or a ranger to you. Why is it? Purely because those don't get them a lot of revenue. A good punch or a good forward ranger is far more important than many other. It's like the strength of a spine surgeon, a good ronger, good burst if it's possible, good nibblers. You know that the ligamentum flavin and the inferior facets of the superior vertebrae are the key in terms of giving you the good decompression. We talked about pass and facet joint integrity being maintained and you'll be sure that you have done a good job. How do you know them? We'll talk about that. The adequacy of the lateral decompression is by surely showing medial and lateral mobility of the nerve root by about at least a centimeter. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule that one centimeter movement, but you should see good play. An early passage of a Penfield probe, which you've seen all of us do, volar and dorsal to the root in the zone three. You know the zone three, what we talked about. Now, these two are your adequacies of lateral decompression. Unless you've achieved this, you've not done the job. Now, when I talk about these, these are on the basis of doing laminectomy. So a big hoo-ha happened of laminectomies being not good because they create instability, the spine becomes unstable. So there are a lot of other procedures like laminotomies, laminoplasties, distraction laminoplasties, porthole microlaminotomies, distraction devices, which are not relevant in this context in this talk. But what is the essence of these? They cause lesser instabilities. That was what they all wanted to say. But 
for you, the message is whatever mechanism you do the decompression, it has to be adequate. If you're very confident you can do good laminotomies and good, good decompression, I'm happy with the idea. You can't do a laminotomy because you saw somebody else do it and do a unfinished job. Now where to fuse and take home message for fusion is this slide. Preoperatively, you look at how much the back pain is there in this individual for activities of daily living. And this is a very important question. For example, if somebody says, I can't bend and lift a pen on the floor, or I really find even sitting for 10 minutes painful, that's back pain in activity in daily living. You look at the age, which means chronologically, this patient is about 50, active 50 year old, or a very old 65 year old. You have to look at that. Look at the imaging, whether it is lithetic, lytic, or scoliotic. And are you going to be operating the same level again? For example, you did an L45 stenosis and you realize that the same level is going to be operated. These are your preoperative factors. What are your interoperative factors? You started to decompress. You went far beyond. You had to encroach on the facets. You had to probably even break the pass inadvertently. Then obviously you need to look at fusion. Or a disc, a good disc, which is completely almost a large part of the disc leaving a void in the front, you probably need to look at fusion in LCS. So this is the diagrammatic representation of the conditions or indications for spinal fusion, as we discussed here. Now, what fusion? Which is another big argument. Did you do a posterolateral fusion or you do an interbody fusion? Now, why posterolateral fusion? Now, you have to remember that most stenotics are like this, if you can see in the diagram. They have settled discs. They have osteophytic, self-stabilizing, lipping, happening already. So what you need is just decompress the nerve and you do what we call as the intertransverse graft here. What are the downsides about this? The problem with this is we are not too sure whether actually fusion happens because the substrate is very poor. There could be like a lot of bone put at one point but never show great fusion as much as the interbody does. But for an age group, low demand back with very well settled discs with osteophytes which are anyway self-stabilizing, you don't need to be aggressive to break open this and put interbody fusions. But where will you do it? Like I said, a good foraminal height, a large discectomy, or other things, you know, osteoporosity, you feel the postlateral fusion will not work, then you do an interbody fusion. Like this, which means a good disc height here, a stenotic with a disc here. Obviously, you don't want to let this disc collapse with time, so therefore an interbody fusion. This is obviously an old picture that I've taken. Where in scoliosis, in a flexible curve, you'll use it. In painful curves, somewhere where in side bending, you see lateral listhesis, which is going either side, or some kyphosis or imbalance, which you can prove. Once you've decided that, you have to keep in mind and be ready for complications. So dural tears, infections, arachnoiditis, persistence of symptoms, and recurrence of symptoms. These are complications that can happen. And generally, a wrong level and missed pathology are the commonest immediate complications that you can have. Obviously, gender and other stuff, obesity and smoking, which are not as important. A last few slides here on preoperative evaluation being key and how it is important. Please take a preoperative round of the patient with an MR and X-rays and all the investigation in place because you're going to plan it preoperatively. 95% of all of us spine surgeons, and for that matter, any orthopedic surgeon, has preoperatively planned this procedure. You can't plan it intraoperatively. So because you are being specific, quick, or traumatic, and don't increase the period of anesthesia because these are comorbid patients. So a few ticks and tips here. A good head ring is important because you can't have eye pressure or maxillary pressure or mandible pressure causing problems. Catheterize all of them because they're old. You can't ask a patient with a lumbar canal stenosis operate to go for passing urine three hours from surgery. So catheterize, Ryle's tube for gastric decompression and good eye padding because eyes are treacherous. And there are patients whom we all know, we've all had it, lumbar canal stenosis operated, but visual acuity gone or, you know, kind of a little partial blindness, which does recover most times, but a problem for sure. Get them positioned well. And it's very important, simple bolsters, or to anything high-end that's available in corporate, but positioning is important. Hypotensive anesthesia. See to it that the arm doesn't get pulled inadvertently because the blood-brain barrier we all laugh about, where the anesthetist is trying to be too excited to get access to IV lines. The hands actually end up causing you know, traction palsies. 
Now, this is a big blunder. If all of you can see that I want to do a fusion and this was how the table was arranged for the surgery. What's wrong here? Obviously, this one's not going to let you take an AP view. So get the radiolucent top well exposed. Good magnification, good illumination. Now, fortunately, all of us use obviously our own headlights and loops, which makes it easy. But when you go down and start your own practice, good lights, good illumination key. Always dissect from caudal to kephalad. Why? Because you denervate the muscles lesser and you make devascularize them lesser. Like I said, good instruments are key and not so much good implants. Don't get too excited. Invest in good instruments, a good forward punch, a good sharp cutting cobs. All these are important. Uh, careful when you dissect through for fusions that you don't go inadvertently in the intertransverse area because of peritoneum and excess bleeding. So you have to be careful. And even the exiting route here, check the level. You can use multiple, even the CRM, X-rays, whatever you want. You ideally have an L4-5-S1 stenosis. You all know that when you sound the sacrum, it sounds different because of the hollowness and the cancellous bone. I give solimidrol or steroids. A lot of us don't. There is no evidence to prove, but preloading is a good idea. Sharp instruments, I said, like I said, osteodomes, forward punches, midaxes. Always rest your hand, and this is your main hand. This is your functional hand, but this is a main hand which doesn't let you plunge in and cause a problem. Look for specific bleeders. You always know bony edges bleed. Use a bone wax and dura to stop them. Good sharp cuts on ligamentum with a dura protecting underneath. See to it that you don't go far laterally to break the pars or the facets. Like P.S. Ramani used to say, Dr. Ramani, that you use the forward punches along and not at perpendicular. Use cotinoids and obviously use what we call as um, suctions with rubber tubes to make it earth traumatic. These are the most important things in lumbar canal syndrome. All of us have seen these additions that you can see. Inadvertently, if you pull them, you will lead to a CSF leak and dural rupture. So be careful and don't be aggressive, especially working anteriorly. These are very important because when you try to take a disc fragment out, you could inadvertently take a plunge into the dural cell. The end point of a lumbar canal stenosis is root mobility. You cannot not afford have no point doing central canal stenosis release without root release because you're doing a half job done. Most failed laminectomy is done for lumbar canal stenosis because of the lack of the root being exposed. Always keep the dura wet. Saline is the best. And remember that the only time that you need to look at interbody as part is these scenarios, which is a discectomy, large facets, facetal tropism, Somewhere there is a lot of medially facet, facet, uh, medially placed, which needs joint excision, pars, and a high young active demand, high demand back. For example, this one, uh, last few slides, last few slides here, but this is important because the stenotic with the large disc, if you see a good maintained disc height, if you look at the flexion extension views, you can document instability well. But most important, what we talked about the effusion, can you see them with the arthropathic changes in the CT? This classically is where you would do an interbody. If I was giving this talk 15 years ago, I wouldn't have discussed the MIS, but I thought you should have a few slides, last few slides to know about what the MIS is all about, the minimally invasive. One of the problems with people who started like us, we started with open and went on to MIS is whether the decompression is adequate. How can you do this with such a small incision? That's one of our own cases where you can see the adequacy of decompression. The other thing is, how are you going to put screws and implants inside? Uh, learning curve, yes, but it works. What's the advantage here? The advantage is that you're handling very few muscle tissue. We all want to respect soft tissue. The advantage is the lack of use of excessive soft tissue here, as you can see here in this photograph in one of our own cases. Can we do the opposite side? Yes, like you've seen all of us do it, used by dropping your, uh, what we call as the retract as well, so that you can decompress on the opposite side with adequately, which you can see here. So at the end of the day, minimum muscle usage, but at the same time, adequate fusion, which you can see here. So you have to have an idea why MIS, that doesn't mean you've seen MIS surgeries and you're going to do it them the first instant. 
but you should need to know what they are about. So what are the carry home messages? Lumbar canal stenosis constitute a large part of our orthopedic spine practice. And eventually when you all go out and practice orthopedic surgery, this is going to be, if I want to call it the commonest cases that you're going to see. For the spine surgeon like me, it's bread and butter as we call it. Be aware of the natural history of the condition. Let's presume a patient, Parkinsonism, stroke, post bypass, diabetic, hypertension, 85 year old, doesn't even walk up to the loo and he has got severe stenosis. Please remember that you're not going to do any good to him, probably more harm to him in trying to think about a surgical treatment. So very, very important that you look at the patient's condition and the natural history of lumbar canal stenosis. Once you decide that this patient needs surgery, you have to have a classical clinical radiological correlation. Just because it's stenotic in the MR, but he's grossly diabetic, uncontrolled, with peripheral neuropathy, you can't promise the world to him. Pre-op patient selection and workup is very important, like I said, everything from an X-ray to a Doppler, if in doubt. Ability to do a surgery. That means I have seen about 20 MIs. Let's go and offer it to a patient. Doesn't mean that it indicated in all patients. Selection of the surgical option is critical depending upon what the surgeon and the institution, apart from the fact what the lesion demands, not just because you've learned to do MIs, you have to do it. Is fusion mandatory? No but it has to be used effectively in indicated. 